So Garuda Prabhu, welcome to the Monks podcast. Thank you very much for sparing your time. You know, in uh, when I read your book, The Beloved Lord's Secret Love Song, hmm? uh, somehow since my childhood, I loved the English language. Hmm? Hmm. And after I was introduced to Bhakti, among all our books, I somehow loved the Bhagavad Gita very much. Hmm. And in your book, I found the most exquisite use of the English language to convey the message of the Bhagavad Gita. So I just completely could say fell in love, not just with your book, but actually fell in deeper love with the Bhagavad Gita because of your book. Oh, right. wonderful. <laughs> Very gratified to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, also, you know, the I have heard about how you entered into academia and the many adventures by which you were able to get into it and how doors opened. And your Ras Lila book is also amazing. It's, uh, it's opened new dimensions of the Ras Panchadhyaya, which I had yes. never thought about. And the most amazing point I find about your presentation is, you know, you, can, you are very deeply devotional while at the same time being deeply academic. That's, mm. a ten- that's a tension that is not easy to resolve. Yes, you know, yes. You know, because you have to have a certain level of criticality to be in the academia. But, yes. th- but it's not that you lack the criticality, but the criticality doesn't obstruct the devotion that emerges from your books. So that mm. is an amazing achievement. So I- Actually, uh, Chaitanya Charanji, I'm sort of astonished to hear your level of perception along with your appreciation. It Honestly, I have to tell you, it's fairly rare that I actually hear anything like this from devotees. First of all, that they would pay any attention to my books. And secondly, if they do, to actually understand the way you have. I have to say, I, I'm... Uh, a, a little astonished. I mean, we once, when we first met, I remember in the Potomac Temple, you expressed it briefly, and I was a little shocked then. I have to say, I'm more shocked now. In a good way, shocked, you know. <laughs> Actually, although I have not written a lot, I don't read books as a reader, I read books as a writer. Mm, okay. And yeah. of course, I think all writers do that. But especially books written by devotees, I try to read them as a writer. So then yeah. I try to see what is being done over there. Yes. And, okay. So and, with a special with a special eye to appreciate the way language is used, um, the way ideas are conveyed, and how audiences can be uh, enthused. Yes, true. Yes, you, you know, sometimes Chaitanya Charanji. Sometimes it will take me a whole week to write a single paragraph. Really? Holy week? The word crafting has to be so careful with very critical portions of a book that will convey very deep ideas without dummying down, but yet um, uh, simple enough to be absorbed. You know how some vitamin pills, yeah. they, they have, um, uh, what do they call, extra absorbable, you know, 24-hour release, you know, something like that. So, you know, in a way, sometimes writing has to have embedded within it ideas and, and uh, uh, a way of expressing them that will be absorbed immediately, but even more deeply over time. That's rich word crafting and writing. Yes. Where every word has its place. It's 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 a hard thing. It's a uh, it, it's a lot of tapas, as you know. You're a writer. You know, writing is a tapas. Yeah, it's it's very absorbing, but it can sometimes be very exasperating. Also, <laughs> <if you don't. laughs> pleasurable and painful at the same time. That's true. <laughs> That's right. 
So we we concur on that, Chaitanya Charge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's right. That's true. So just a few more words about writing, if you don't mind, before we move forward. So so, yes. so when you write, do you you know, I have read in writing books about how a writer, each writer has a creative voice and a critical voice and uh, or a creative side and the critical side. So if the creative side is strong and the critical side is not very strong, then the, uh, that author writes a lot, but then the quality is not very high. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the critical side is very strong. Then the author doesn't write much. But what they write is, is like nectar. Mm. So I talked with Ravindra Sarup Prabhu and Ravindra Sarup Prabhu told me that I can't go to a second sentence unless I have completed a first sentence. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so I think he falls more on the critical side. Yes. Uh, it's the critical side is very high. And uh, maybe no disrespect, but Satsurup Maharaj falls more on the, he's more of a creative writer. Every day, write yeah. something. So, I, from what I understand, you for you have a high critical side, isn't it? That's why you spend a lot of time in going through each word. How would you place yourself? It's 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 a critical side, but it 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 really has to be a tremendous blend of both, because you're speaking to people now. You have to remember, I'm a university professor at the undergraduate level and then at the graduate level i am at another university on the west coast so i'm on the virginia side and on the california side but so i'm used to having to present ideas in front of people who pay lots of money to get an education from me mm -hmm. um and even doctoral students that i mentor so i have to make sure that things are written in just such a way. So for example, uh, I was tasked with completing Tamal Krishna Goswami's book. Um, you may know the book, right? Uh, I think you wrote the introduction in the first chapter. Yes. You wrote the introduction, yeah. Yes, I'm, for some reason I can't find it. The Living Theology of Krishna Bhakti, isn't it? That's right, A Living Theology, that's right. A Living Theology of Krishna Bhakti. In the first, I mean, the first paragraph, it's you, you, you either gain a reader or you lose a reader. Mm. That first paragraph is either a hook or you've lost them. So it's so important to write in a way that is precise, that is honest, but that is, uh, that has the ability to connect with the hearts as well as the minds of your audience. After all, how we feel after we read something determines whether we're going to read more. I feel bored. Why would I go further? I feel excited. Now I'm going to read more. I'm intrigued. Maybe I'll read more and see what happens. So it seems to be one of those three. Bored, intrigued, or interested? What was the third thing? In, intrigued. So, yeah. Bored, so, and third was? I, I would say bored or moved, really moved, or intrigued. Okay. Sort of in the middle. Yeah. You know? So, mm. what, uh, obviously, ideally, we write to move the minds and the hearts of others. So I, I give it my all, Chaitanya Charanji. I, I really do. And it seemed to have sunk into someone like you for which I am uh, extremely pleased to hear. So okay. that is an honor to hear that. And I mean, the, the Bhagavad Gita, um, the beloved Lord's secret love song, it has sold over 50,000 copies. 50,000? That's amazing. Yeah. Is that, is that, a, is that a, was it published by academic press or a, like a, a trade press? How, who published it, it? It's published by a very prestigious, very high worldwide trade press. 
who likes to take academics that know how to speak to people widely and not to get stuck within the academic jargon. So that's an ideal author for a trade press that wants to bring in scholarship, but not have it locked by scholarship. So that's what I sought to do here. That's what I sought to do. And I think, you know, this is what, in one sense, we as a tradition are lacking. For example, you know, not many people read scientific papers, but if atheism has spread, it is because of, say, popularizers of science like Richard Dawkins and others. Now, Richard Dawkins' arguments may not be great, but he is a good writer. He, he, he has some... Oh, absolutely. Chaitanya Charan, you know, when I was in graduate school um, at both University of Chicago and Harvard University, I was reading Vedanta with one of the world's greatest scholars at the time. Okay. So first we started with the Jaimini Sutra, and we talked about Purva Mimangsa, and we looked at the Prabhakara and Kumara Labhata Abhashyas, <clears throat> and he was preparing me with all of the Mimangsa hermeneutics and the tools to be qualified to read Vedanta. And then he said, okay, now it's time to read the Sharidaka Mimangsa Bhashya of Shankaracharya. I went, oh, um, can, we, can we skip that and go to the Sri Bhashya of Ramanujacharya? And he said, you won't be able to appreciate the Sri Bhashya of Ramanujacharya unless you've appreciated the Sharidakami Mangsabhashya of Shankaracharya. Okay. But of course, echoing in my head, Chaitanya Charanji was, you know, Krishna Das Kaviraj's statement in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, even a Mahabhagavata can fall down reading the Shari Dakimi Mangsabhashya. I went, oh my God. Now, how do I explain this to my professor? Of course, I cannot explain. Mm. So I called up some of my god brothers and said, what do I do? I mean, I'm trying to get out of this. But I have an assignment here to read the Sharidaka Mimangsabhashya of Shankaracharya. What do I do? Well, consulting with my various god brothers back then who supported my academic work, because I was the first devotee to go back into academics with the express purpose of becoming an expert on us, on our tradition. Okay. They said, Garuda, well, if this famous professor is telling you to read it, I think you have to read it. But if I were you, I'd pray like anything at Lord Chaitanya's lotus feet. You know, that kind of thing. And it was, you know, pray for protection because it is very serious to read the the Shadi Dakavi Mansabhashya. Now, the only reason I bring this up, Chaitanya Charanji, is because of your earlier point which was very good. Good writing is very seductive. Mm. Dawkins, I think, is successful more because of his writing than because of what he says. Yes. And guess what? Shankara is the same way. What I learned from Shankara is that his Sanskrit was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was pristine. It had a monumental feeling to it. Sort of like reading Shakespeare in English. I, there's nothing quite equivalent, but reading something so powerfully phrased. And it wasn't that it was, um, you know, uh, elaborate, running on, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, embellished, and, and um, uh, uh, sort of erudite, you know, dripping with over erudition. No. It had a simplicity about it and a beauty that I'll never forget. And I have to confess to you that my writing 
sort of takes after what Shankara was doing, but I transfer that to the English language. And so when I write, every word is so very carefully placed. No extraneous words. Every word fits there. There are no lacking of words, I hope, but there are no extraneous words. Just like a fine piece of art. Nothing extra in the composition because that weakens the composition. Yes. Nothing lacking in the composition because that too weakens the composition. And if you think about it, our ultimate vision of Krishna Bhakti is a perfect picture. And it's a divine picture. Mm -hmm. So I've had the good fortune of also encountering our ultimate vision, the Sarva Lila Chudamani, the crown jewel of all Lilas, the Rasa Lila. But that too was something that was imposed on me unexpectedly. I don't want you to get the impression, Chaitanya Charji, that you know, I went to graduate school, went to Harvard for a doctorate, and, and uh, all to write the Ras Lila. No, I never had that intention. Never. The way it happened, if, I'm, if I may tell you the story. Please. Is that all right if I tell you? Yeah. Please. Is I was always planning to do what Prabhupada had instructed in some earlier letters to Giriraj Swami about you know, if what we, he could do if he stayed on to graduate school. His parents had complained to Prabhupada that he was in school and very talented and um, that they would like to keep him in school. Well, it turned out Giriraj Swami decided not to stay in school. I mean, obviously, he's yeah. uh, an important member of our society. But he gave Giriraj Swami an instruction that I followed. He said, if you can show by comparative study that Krishna Bhakti is the highest theological thesis among all theological theses, this will be a great accomplishment. He said, if you could do this by comparative study. So my doctorate from Harvard literally says back here, you know, religionum comparationum, comparative religion in Latin. They still write their diplomas in Latin for whatever ungodly reason. But in any case, um, so I went, I was intending to compare the Christian mystics with our bhakti mystics, particularly Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. Oh, that was always my intention. That's how I got into the doctoral program. I declared that to be my intention. Hmm. Fulfilling Prabhupada's interest and his desire what he called a great accomplishment. So I was sitting one day with my doctoral mentor, as one does at the dissertation level, which is a very intimidating part of getting a doctorate, especially at a place like Harvard. Yeah. Um, and he said, so I'm confident that there are plenty of materials written about the Christian side. I'm not sure about the Vaishnava side. And so I wouldn't want the comparison to be imbalanced. He, he, I said, okay. Um, and then he suddenly sat back and asked me a thunderbolt of a question. He said, Graham, using my legal name, of course, first name, he said, Graham, what is the highest vision of the Chaitanya school? Okay, flipping through my mind, I'm going through Bhagavad Gita. I'm going through all of my Bhagavatam reading over the years. I'm going through everything, you know, I've learned from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. All of this is rapidly going on. I'm putting it all together, and I sat back after a minute, and he was quiet, I was quiet, and I said, well, it would have to be. Raslila. Raslila. That is our highest vision. He said, okay. And then you compare, sorry. Yeah. Well, then he, then he said, has there been enough treatment on that to where you could do comparative work? I said, oh, I'm sure. I mean, it's so well known. He said, show me. 
I scoured the Harvard libraries, the largest library system in the world. I came up with nothing. I came back and reported that. He said, that is your dissertation topic. And that's how I, and then of course, I had the embarrassment of going back to my godbrothers and saying, guess what? I'm writing on the Ross Leela. Oh, oh, that's great. Oh, that's just great, Garuda. Okay. You know, you know, I mean, it's just the Ross Leela, there was a stigma for years and years and years. You just don't even talk about the Ross Leela, yeah. even though it's plainly there in Krishna book, you know, um, it's, it's there in the Bhagavatam, although Prabhupada stopped short of several chapters uh, and, and, and uh, Gopi Purana Dana and Rita Ananda took over and did that translation. And, um, uh, but, but mine was uh, to pay attention to what is found in our tradition that can ultimately enter into dialogue with other traditions. Mm. So I have written articles on the supreme expression of love in Vaishnavism compared to the supreme expression of love in Christianity. And that is the song of the songs, isn't it? I That's think. right. Well, well, it's, it, it, can, it starts with the Song of Solomon, but very, it depends on which Christian mystic you will look at. Okay. But yes, the Song of Solomon becomes the kind of their Ras Lila, if yeah. you will. That's okay? And so, I, I, of course, and I've written that, about that in the, as you know, in the introduction to my, my book published by yeah, Princeton. That's true. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, it's, it's quite a journey. And I got, you know, suddenly I'm stuck writing about the Ras Lila. So it got around the movement. Do you know what Karun is doing? He's writing about the Ras Lila. I, I've been confronted. Once I gave a lecture at a Sunday feast uh, in Alachua in about 2005 when the book first came out. And a devotee said to, stood up and said, what qualifications do you have to write about the Ras Lila? Are you a pure devotee? Can you imagine getting confronted like that in front of 300 devotees? <laughs> so, my simple answer was Chaitanya Charanji. I never intended to write about the Ras Lila. This was, it landed on my lap. But all I can tell you is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srila Prabhupada, their grace is stronger than all of my misgivings, weaknesses, and mistakes. They will work through me in spite of me. I have complete faith. So all of my weaknesses are not nearly as powerful as Krishna's grace. And that's what I depend on. That's all I can say. There is no qualification. The only qualification is my connection to the Guru Parampara. What other qualification can anyone claim? That's my only qualification. Well, as it turns out, I've become the world's authority in the academic world on the Ras Lila, such that if someone writes something very negative as a scholar, all journals and publishers know Graham Schweig is the authority, the world's authority on the Ras Lila. We have to send it for peer review with him. So I have tossed out several bad treatments of the Ras Lila. So I've become a kind of academic guard yeah. of the Ras Lila. I'm protecting the Ras Lila from bad treatment. I didn't know it would have that effect, but it turns out I'm a protector of the Ras Lila in the academic world. Yeah, that's amazing because after I read your, your book on the Ras Lila, I actually didn't read the Ras Panchadhyay. I first read your book. I mean, I read Krishna book, of course. Right. That, kept the, that part of the 10th canto I had skipped. So, yes. And it struck me 
that actually the kind of explanation that you had given you know if we don't give that then we are actually it's not that people are going to be silent that's right people are going to speak and the we sometimes think that in protecting our tradition if we don't touch our tradition that yes. doesn't mean others are not going to touch it that's so, right so exactly exactly chaitanya charanji we cannot be ever embarrassed about what is so precious and highest in our tradition yeah let's say i have a a huge diamond ring well it's so valuable i'm not going to wear it anywhere i'll just keep it in a safe well what's the point of having the ring if you're not going to wear it <laughs> you know I mean? you never look at it you never see it you never enjoy it the It, it, you know to be embarrassed or or um um uh, afraid of of explaining to outsiders that our vision is a vision of dancing with god for all eternity that that's perfection i mean well, why is that an embarrassment that is a beautiful vision eternal dancing eternal singing with divinity is our is our goal Beautiful. It is a dance of divine love. We are a tradition about love, Chaitanya Charanji, as you well know. Why deny that? And why are we denying that even among each other? And why are we denying that even about the world? It's sad to me that devotees can miss the whole point of the movement, which is to develop the heart. to such pure and abundant levels and to be able to offer that heart to others and to krishna that is our whole that's our whole effort uh, let's listen to what what uh, prabhu pad says here uh, in the nectar devotion the basic principle of the living condition is that we have a general propensity to love someone hmm. devotees may too often think that it's just sex life you know love and sex life is one and the same they conflate them and there's no love in this world i've actually heard major leaders in our movement i mean major and i'm not going to mention names tell me that there's no love in this world and i said i'm sorry swamiji or prabhu ji you are not reading Prabhu Pad's books carefully enough. Yes, no one can live without loving someone. Prabhu Pad says here. Yeah. This propensity is present in every living being. Yes. We are Vaishnavas who focus on cultivating the hearts in ourselves, among ourselves, and then offering that to others. this is our process yes bro bro just a little pause you know you are flowing with devotion yeah. now so yeah. you know, we did spend a significant amount of time discussing writing as so i was wondering whether you would like to we could have a discussion about writing in bhakti itself and then mm. we could discuss about love separately because we almost spent about 25 minutes and i had some few questions as well as i wanted to share some of my experiences in writing are you okay yes. with the topic uh, you're the boss i had i had a lot to say about writing first is that uh, in some ways when say when you when i appreciated writing and i could see that you were were happy about it in the sense that, that writing is quite lonely and the amount of work we put in we don't really get we don't it's not that we are hungry for appreciation right this is the recognition that you know how much amount of effort and thought has gone into it yes. on the other hand you know i compare see i am a writer as well as a speaker yes i thought that i'm a i'm not a i'm not particularly a great speaker but i can see that many of my i say i may prepare 10 minutes for a one hour class and for a 300 word article i write every day on the bhagavad gita a small 300 word article i've been doing this for the last 10 years almost so for that wow. one hour Beautiful. for that 
for that one hour article i for 300 word article i spend about an hour or so ha huh? more than an hour daily but it's the number of devotees who might appreciate a class which i have really not prepared that much as compared to an article which i have prepared so much <laughs> yes it, it is so it becomes almost a, a little bit discouraging in writing of course i <laughs> yes. have few devotees who do appreciate but yes. how do we how do you look at uh, the reciprocation for the effort that you put in writing where do you get that rasa or reciprocation yes there is an internal reciprocation and an external reciprocation so when i heard your very not just appreciative words but they were words of 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 deep uh perception of what what i was doing and this is so it was not empty praise it was genuine appreciation sometimes devotees you know a devotee never accepts praise you know and we hear that vaishnavas do not like praise and you know what i don't like praise and when devotees come up to me and say oh prabhu that was a wonderful class thank you so much that was so beautiful it was one of the best classes i immediately interrupt them and say please tell me what was it in my class that moved you then the real conversation starts that's true yes okay what actually did you get from the class but those who just say oh no i just it was a wonderful class i say okay go away <laughs> i don't literally do that but you know what i'm saying yeah. it doesn't mean anything to me it's just empty praise and sometimes i think devotees they see senior prabhupad disciple harvard phd i just go up and praise him no i no, i don't like that you know, i don't like that at all to echo this i also do the exact same thing if somebody appreciates i ask what do you appreciate and there has been two yeah. results of that the two results many devotees don't even come to appreciate and those who come to appreciate they know i have to come prepared with some specific <laughs> point <laughs> that's good yeah very good that's yeah. very good yeah so there is a difference between praising and appreciating appreciation is good in fact we vaishnavas need to appreciate one another more not just writers where you and i are writers and speakers and so on but just in general it's so important to appreciate one another mm. not empty praise jai chaitanya charan ji jai chaitanya charan ji jai jai chaitanya charan ji i mean come on how much of that can you take what do i really appreciate when you speak what do i really appreciate when you write btg articles you know what do i get this is this then becomes the substance of shravanam kirtanam between us and then we're lifted up into an, a new community of vishnu smarla you and i get lifted up into vishnu smarla the the shravanam kirtanam that we trade back and forth in dialogue then lifts us up it's a beautiful thing this these three foundational processes are the foundation of everything so it's about appreciating it's about sharing it's about mutually enlightening one another bodhayanta parasparan the verse you well know everyone knows that verse so so are the internal that, are you saying that you have some friends with whom whenever you write you are able to do after writing do this bodhayanta parasparam I mean, of course well of course there are you know disciples you know students of mine and 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 there are um but these these disciples of mine are not just yes men or yes women no i again i don't want praise i don't accept praise i only want dialogue and i want honest criticism if they are troubled by something i want them to say it if there there there's some doubt about something i want them to express it if there's some question left over i want them to inquire about it this is genuine heart to heart as well as head to head that's what makes the life of bhakti so rewarding now you ask me so 
how, wh where, where do I get my uh, uh, connections, I think you said, something to that effect. And I responded internally and externally, right? Yeah. Now, <coughs> excuse me. You mentioned that lo writing can be a very lonely task. Yes and no at the same time. Okay. Lonely in the sense, hey, I can't, you know, yeah. hey, hey, I can't, call me back. I can't talk to you. You know, I, you know call, call me back. I can't, go away. Everyone go away. It's a singular task. Mm. But it's not lonely because as you write, you are connecting with everyone in the Guru Parampara. You are joining a new community of writers. That's very profound. Joining a new community or a yes. whole community. It's new. It's in the sense of fresh. It's fresh. Every time I write, it's new. So it's, it's fresh. It's new in the sense that it's just starting when I, I write about this or I write about that. So right now I'm um, uh, producing my translation and interpretation of the Yoga Sutra and proving that it's actually a bhakti text if one looks at it with the bhakti velochana. Mm. And I showed this in my book proposal to Yale University Press. They said, why, there are so many yoga sutras, why should we even publish yours? I showed them the difference between mine and theirs. They went wild. A press as prestigious as Yale. So they gave me a contract. Now I've got to come up with the writing, right? As I write about the Yoga Sutra and I write commentary, I am drawing from Rupa Goswami. I am drawing from Jiva Goswami, from Krishna Das Kaviraja Goswami, from Vishwanatha Chakravarti, from Baladeva Dubushana, from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, from Bhakti Thakur, and of course, our beloved Srila Prabhupada. So sometimes devotees ask me, so who do you go for your association when you need it? Well, I have, I have my God brothers like you and others that I can, you know, talk to about writing, but I also commune with our great parampara. When we write, it's as if they are either working through you or they're not. Okay, so... The idea is that the electricity of the prampra is working through you into what you're writing. Your love for the tradition, your love for what our theology is about, in essence, must come through the writing. And then you have very good company with everyone in the Guru Parampara. So it's a very powerful experience. Things Things come out of you, you've, I know you've had the experience, things come out of you that you never knew were there. Where do you think that came from, Chaitanya Charan? That came, that came from a very powerful tradition that is now speaking through you. That's where that comes from. It's powerful, isn't it? Yeah, I also experienced this while speaking, while writing. Thoughts, yes. We get thoughts that we didn't even know we had. That's right. That's right. And then, of course, you know, get, getting together with God brothers and God sisters who give their feedback. And I said, oh, wow, that's a very important point. Mm. So it works through them. So you've got, so we have, so in one sense it's lonely, but in another sense, you couldn't have better Sangha. It's beautiful. So now, if I may play slightly a devil's advocate. Oh yes, I love devils. Yeah, that's fine. See, I have also re I have read a lot of books on writing. So yes. because so now this is an experience which even those who are not devotees they have. I read in the book yeah. on writing that we don't write only to express our thoughts. We write also to discover our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in that sense. Uh, getting ideas that uh, 
which we didn't even know we had or getting some kind of we can say mini revelations yes that happens to even those authors who are not connected with krishna in the sense yes. they are not ex- they are not external devotees but of course we could say they are connecting with the super soul in their hearts but yes. is there essentially uh, not just a conceptual difference but a experienceable difference between say when a devotee writes for krishna and a non devotee author somehow i don't even like the word non devotee but just yes. functionally i don't know if there's any other word for that yes but, uh, but i know what you mean of course yeah. yes. <laughs> so so uh, so a, a person who is not say explicitly connected or devoted to god that person writes so is there is writing itself a communion with something bigger than ourselves yes respective of the subject that we are writing about yes beautiful it's a beautiful question um first of all um all writers <laughs> all writers are in some sense instrumental to the culture in which they find themselves and the culture uh that they are uh, transmitting so culture is very powerful and in some sense um writers are instruments of a culture so there is a little bit of that kind of uh experience of discovering not only one's own thoughts but discovering what their culture is about that is somehow been distilled in each one of them powerful writers experience this yes now honestly i I'll, I'll confess to you chetan and jaranji i have never read one book on how to write it's just through my, all my you know three masters degree i'm an over educated idiot okay so i mean through all my writing and all my years of having to write and writing endless papers papers that would stack up to here from the from the desk i mean and then going through the dissertation process and then of course my experience as um uh as as a bhakta all of that comes together in creating my writing voice now of course outsiders don't have that extra guru parampara connection mm-hmm. and they don't write about krishna but you know i've seen some scholars write eloquently about krishna is that amazing yeah eloquently it can happen but i've also seen scholars use our tradition and speak in the kind of a mixed way you know i mean look all we have to do is use the tools of buddhi yoga right there are sattvika scholars you know rajasa scholars and tamasa scholars and writing when it's sattvika is clear and so much comes through rajasa kind of gets stuck a little bit but stuff gets through as well tamasa writing is kind of narrow and kind of dark and doesn't really contribute much it's interesting um, that you are classifying raja satwa raja tamas here <coughs> not based on the content of the writing but on the uh, on the mode of writing or the transmissibility of the writing which is very that's right yes the level of transmission because um you know i i was um, at at in a university once when uh, uh, a professor i did he wasn't my professor but he was famous and he got the nobel prize for literature hmm. and he doesn't write about krishna at all okay but then again you know let's examine that statement is it possible to write about anything that is not a part of krishna no it's impossible that anything is separate from krishna they just don't know it but they are utilizing aspects of art literature um um uh you know the 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 realm of aesthetics they're tuning into 
how powerful their art can be. And ultimately, that power comes from Krishna. Just like love ultimately comes from the Thladdini Shakti mm. with, from within Krishna and Radha. So that, all that, that power, that power manifests in part, but the devotee is not satisfied with part. We want the whole thing. So we go to Krishna. We go to Radha and Krishna. We are in Parampara, Guru Parampara, to Radha and Krishna. And therefore, our opportunities are exceptional. But that doesn't mean that a devotee is automatically a good writer. Of course not. Right. That's true. You know, this is right. a lot of points you said, if I could just reflect on some of them. Sure. I'm stunned that you, you said that you have not read a single book on writing. That is, you know, I read one author, she says that, have you heard of this Elizabeth Gilbert? That no. of the Eat, Eat, Pray, Love, she wrote a famous book. Oh, I've heard of that book. Yes. Yeah, so she is probably among the nearest who comes to theism. So she says in one of her books that it's called Big Magic that you know, many of the top authors, after they wrote their best book, you know, they went into depression and some of them even committed suicide. So she says, why does this happen? So she says, I needed a psychological model, psychological construct that would protect me from such depression because after I wrote Eat, Pray, Love and it became an international bestseller, you know, I knew that every book of mine would be compared with that. So she has this theory that she doesn't explicitly talk about God, but she says ideas are floating around in ether and ideas are just waiting to come into the yes. heart of a person. And if we just are receptive, so sometimes the idea will come to us and force us Sometimes we keep plugging on and the idea doesn't come to us. This yes. all, all that we can do is we can just show up and do our part. So it's almost right. like karmanne vadika raste ma phale shu you know, that right. It's very much yeah. like that. So anyway, yeah. I, I quoted her for this point that in writing, so she advises writers, she says that I don't recommend any author to ever, any prospect, aspiring author to go and get a degree in writing. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. So you know, I would consider yes. among the best writers. So is it simply by the process of writing uh, that you have developed as a writer? That's certainly part of it, Chaitanya Charanji. But you know, if you look at yourself, you're not you're you're not someone who just practices writing or just writes a lot. You have a passion. Definitely. You must have a passion. You must have something that needs to be said desperately. That's what I feel. That's what I experience. I write books not because I love writing. In fact, honestly, I really don't like writing very much. I write because I can't help it. I have to. Because there is a need for people to know this stuff. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, the great secret, the greater secret, and the greatest mm -hmm. secret of all. I said, how can I not write this? I have to write this. People don't know this. It's there subtly in Prabhupada's books, but I need to underscore it. I need to emphasize it. I need to yell it out. I had to write it. Mm -hmm. It's a passion, Chaitanya Charan. It's, it's something that causes you to roll around and be restless in your sleep. You know, it, it just, you, you can't rest. It's something that stirs around and, 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 and bothers you, troubles you. Someone's talking to you and, you and you apologize because you didn't quite hear what they said. Why? Because it's still rolling around in your head. You can't pay attention to other things because you've got to get it out. That's true. So true. You know, I have noticed this in a different way that it's very difficult to write a book just because somebody tells you to write on a topic. <laughs> That's right. Very difficult. You have to have a, it's a sense it has to I come from it. within. It has right. to come from within. That's right. 
Mm, so that's, that was right. one, that's one point. And another point which you said that as a, the thoughts keep going inside, you know, you have a burning message which you want to share. Yes. Uh, I consider Jayadwait Maharaj to be my writing guru. Uh-huh. So we, we, yeah. He did once did a writing seminar and we asked him what, what is the most important uh, qualification for a writer? And he said the same thing what you said that a burning desire to share a message. Mm-hmm. Yes. Everything else will follow after that. That's right. So now, exactly. if that is there, that we have certain ideas we want to share. Now, sometimes there is that maybe not fear exactly, but we could say uh, skepticism towards either oneself or toward the world, whether any, whether I'll be able to express this message, it's an important message, whether yes. I'll be able to express it or whether anybody in the world will be able, will hear it, will appreciate it. Yes. And both ways we can get, we can actually get choked. And yeah. you know, when you wrote on the Rasleela, I suppose you might have faced both of these because as you told me about how you didn't feel qualified, but That's also right. for the audience to understand this, it, it, it is a challenge, isn't it? So how, yes. how, do, how do you deal with these two aspects? Yes. I mean, I could have waddled in my feeling of inadequacy forever, but what was more powerful was the necessary, you know, uh, pa- the, 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 the necessity of having people understand this, Leela, and not to go around misunderstanding it or fearing it on the part of devotees. Okay. Fearing to talk about, it would be tantamount to a Christian who is too embarrassed to talk about the, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. My God. Now, That's the central now, part of their theology. Exactly. Now, you know, uh, admittedly, not every Christian is capable of articulating and and discussing the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But that is their ultimate vision. And, and if they can't talk about it a little bit, or imagine being embarrassed by it, or, or feeling like um, uh, a, a god brother of mine said, um, who said he read my Bhagavad Gita, he loved it, he got so much from it. I said, what about Dance of Divine Love? He said, oh, I'm not touching that. Well, what do you mean you're not touching that? He said, I'm not advanced enough to read about the Ras Lila. I said, well, who is? <laughs> I mean, we're not, you see, it's funny. When we judge ourselves, that's really kind of a fallacy. So you're, you know better than Krishna whether you should read this or not. But it's here. It is the most, it is the ultimate, it's the Lila Sara. It's the essence of all Lilas. And you're telling me that you're not advanced enough. So you, in other words, you must be so advanced to judge that you're not advanced enough to read something so advanced. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> you see how convoluted, it's convoluted. True, true. You know, in other words, it's, it's not that any of us are qualified for this wonderful privilege of participating in this glorious tradition. It's that we are given an opportunity to allow things to flow through us. And that includes reception and understanding of such a high Leela. This is an amazing understanding, Prabhu. If I may rephrase it, what I understood. Yes, please. That in one sense, to consider that we are qualified is is pride, but That's to right. consider that we are unqualified is also pride. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we could say exactly. You... <laughs> so... Exactly. It, it, you know, I don't know if this is true, but it goes around. It sounds so like Prabhupada that there's. You must have heard. There's this story that uh, a devotee said to uh, Prabhupada. Prabhupada, I am the most fallen, and Prabhupada said, "You're not the most anything." <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, so, right. so I don't know whether this is actually accurate, but you know what? It sounds so much like Prabhupada because yeah. the point is, while trying to be so humble, you can't try to be humble. Humility is epiphenomenal of love. Humility, and but here's the fallacy, Chaitanya Charan. Everyone talks about humility, but that's fallacious. You cannot talk about humility without talking about passion. The gopis embody both as epiphenomenal of their perfect and unexcelled love for Krishna. Mm. If I'm just humble without a passion in devotional service, I can become complacent. I can become dis discouraged. I can feel, you know, um, uh, uh, the self-esteem goes way down, you know. But if I have passion without humility, then I can become ego egotistical. I can be um, insensitive. I can be um, uh, uh, proud. Humility and passion both have to be there. And they are natural, both are natural consequences of true love. If I love, if I love you, Chaitanya Charan, I, with humility, I accept you for all who you are. Mm. If I, if, if I have a, but then again, it's not just humility. I don't accept you just as you are. Because if I did, I would simply sit here in silence. That's true. Okay? But I have a passion to know you more. And that's love. Love is full acceptance of Chaitanya Charan. But love is also, I want to know him more. In love, one can never be close enough to the beloved. Wow. So in true friendship, Chaitanya Charan, if I'm your friend, then I'm going to want to know you more. I'm going to want to contribute to you more. But I can't do that properly unless I receive you in all humility. That's beautiful. So, so let just to clarify, I think you're using the word passion not in the sense of the mode of passion. Mode, not mode of passion. In the sense of energy. It's like passionate energy, you could say, or electricity, as you said. Yes. So, yes. You know, oh, okay. So, oh, this is this so resonates with my understanding. I have written a book called, that is, that is you could say, my sleeper hit book. It has sold over 35,000 copies till now. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, Congrats. So, yeah. And, so it is called Gita Wisdom Through Quotes. Uh -huh. So basically, there is a fingerprint is, a, not fingerprint, this is Crossword is one of the big book publishers in India, booksellers actually. They uh -huh. also got into book publishing and they did a series of 365 quotes by eminent people. So 365 quotes by Gandhi, 365 quotes yeah. by Martin Luther King. And they came to know that my, I have a Gita Daily website and I write on the Gita. So they asked me to give 365 quotes from the Gita. Yeah, then, very nice. Then I told them that, you know, I can give 365 verses. I can do a poetic translation also. But the Gita is actually a, a philosophical work of wisdom. You can't take one verse out of it and have it as an inspiring thought. You uh, need to enter, it, into the, enter into the thought world of the Gita, then you get inspired. Yes, yes. So, so what I said is that, I could take the, like the key message of the verses and present them through quotes, which are not the translations of the verses, but they, right. are, they, are, they are conveying the message of the verses. Yes, synthesizing. Yes. So, so one of the things which I wrote there was in that book. So it, was, it is just a small book, 365 quotes. Yeah. And it's available on various airports and other places. So I yeah. thought, who will want to even read such a book like this? But somehow, well, apparently many. <laughs> yeah, right. Apparently many, yeah. So one of the things I wrote over there is, humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. Mm, very nice. 
Very nice. That's an unusual understanding for Iskand devotees because Prabhupada's, in Prabhupada's humility, he was bold. Humility means vulnerable, honest presentation, not hiding, not manipulating, not trying to do something political, no power pulls, but honest presentation of yourself. Not necessarily passive, like humility means like, oh, I have nothing to say, I have nothing to give, I'm not, you know, not like that. Yeah, that's true. But your, but your point is excellent. It, I appreciate it very much. Yes, to not get in the way of actually being yourself in the way you present yourself. Yes, beautiful. Yes, thank you. So that was one point about uh, writing. Books which are actually not written by good writers, which are not actually good writing, they, uh, they receive a greater appreciation, circulation, and books which are, we, we, we are not here for the results in one sense, but at the same time, we, we need to look at, maybe we are doing something wrong and we should do something better. So, right. so you know, it's, it's a joy and a relief for me to meet somebody like you who is so, so passionate about writing as an art. Yes, yes. So now, but you may also have experienced that the you know, books which are nowhere as well written as yours, sometimes they do far better than what your books have done. That's right. That's right. And it yeah. can happen even yeah. in the devotee community. Yes. Yes. So then, and uh, so now, do you see this as, do we see this as our inadequacy? Do we see this that this is the level of the audience? That's what people need, or do we see it as uh, as Krishna wanting us to learn something? H how do you see this? All of the above. Okay. All three points, yes. So, in other words, um, one cannot know the reach and the effect of one's teachings. I know this as a university professor. Sometimes I'll get a letter from a student who's already graduated, and he or she will write to me saying, Dr. Schweig, you have no idea how you have influenced my whole life. Out of the blue, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I can't think back and say, oh yeah, I remember that person. I influenced them really, really, really well. I it, it's unknown to me. We are not to know how powerfully and deeply our teachings are to affect people in their lives or not affect people in their lives. A book can be very, very popular, but then just thrown aside. Um, another book can be not so popular, but something that is kept and is read and consulted over and over, and uh, it is deeply moved. One soul toward Krishna is powerful, you know? So there are different levels at which uh, a teachings work in the form of books and form of lectures and so on. We cannot possibly know. This is only for Krishna. I've had the great privilege, uh, Chaitanya Charan, to lecture at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., okay. where you cannot apply to get in there. Even Radhanath Swami was not able to lecture. At, and he lectures everywhere. <laughs> Is there one place... Radhanath Swami hasn't lectured. I can't think of any. I mean, he goes everywhere. He's very prolific that way. And, and, and um, he's a, a loved speaker. But you cannot get into the Smithsonian and lecture there unless you're invited. They found out about this book. Hmm. They invited me to come and lecture about this book. It was only supposed to be one lecture and a book signing for one evening at the Smithsonian. But the director who introduced me to the 150 people audience, she said she couldn't leave. She was supposed to go home that evening, but she couldn't leave 
because she was so much enjoying the lecture. And from that point on, she said, we will have to get you back here. And ever since 14 years ago, I've given over three dozen lectures at the Smithsonian. Three dozen. They're all, in, they're all invited. You don't just ask. You cannot ask. You're either invited or you're not. So that has been a great privilege. Now, how did I, first of all, I never arranged for the Smithsonian to read this book. And I never arranged to be able to come back dozens of times to speak at the Smithsonian. These things are inexplicable. This is Krishna Kripa. Who gets a chance to teach Krishna Bhakti at the Smithsonian for 14 years? It's, it's Kripa. It's Anugraha. What can I say? These are privileges granted to us. And we all have these special opportunities that come to us that we didn't even expect. If, if 15 years ago, or, or I should say 25 years ago, you were to say, uh, Garuda, I have a crystal ball, and I can see you'll be publishing with the likes of Princeton and Oxford and Yale and HarperCollins and, 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 and you know, Columbia, and I would say Chaitanya Charan, your crystal ball is broken. That is inconceivable. I cannot conceive of all these greatest publishers wanting my books. Well, as it turns out, Chaitan Charan, all those publishers have been wanting my books, are publishing my books, and they can't get enough books from me. I'm behind. They want more books. I'm behind. I can't produce books fast enough for them. Who would have known? These are the special gifts from Guru Parampara. They give us opportunities to continue the teachings. The special privilege we have, you and I, and other devotees in our situations. Special, very special. So, Prabhu, just one question here. When you talk about yes. the Smithsonian, now many devotees may not even understand the speciality of yes. being able to speak over there. So, so then, right. they may not. They may not. Yeah. That's right. So then you probably have to get whatever reciprocation. You have to create a circle where people will appreciate that. A few people will appreciate. And that's all that I need. I don't need more than that. They, they appreciate this opportunity as extraordinary. They know that the Smithsonian is the largest museum complex in the world. Yes, and they have a special lecture series, and they only get the best around the country. What they considered the best. And somehow they include me in that. I don't know how. I really, it doesn't, it's beyond my wildest imagination, honestly. So, again, things happen, and this happens for you, Chaitanya Charan. I know this happens to you. Things happen. Opportunities occur. You know, connections are made. You didn't know. You weren't in control. They happened to you. This is Krishna. You know, this speaks so much to my experience. In India, that one you know, of the top newspapers is Times of India. And Times of India has a spiritual column called Speaking Tree. So uh -huh. I used to read this in my, uh, since my school days. Yeah. I had like a childhood dream that one day I would write over there. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> and then I became a monk. I joined the temple and I started writing for Krishna. And I sent an article to Speaking Tree. And to my amazement, it was published. The just unsolicited article I sent, and I was there you go. ecstatic. Yeah. And then there you go. I, I shared it with the other brahmacharis. You know, my article is published in Speaking Tree. Yeah. And it was like everybody had blank faces. And yeah. then one brahmachari asked me, How does a tree speak? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> but then, so I was so disappointed at that time. But a few uh -huh. days later, Jayadvait Swami visited our temple 
Yeah. And I had got articles published in some smaller newspapers also. And Speaking Tree was my biggest uh, newspaper to get published. So I had put all of them together. Uh -huh. And I showed it to Jayadrayat Maharaj. And he was so happy. Yeah, nice. So profusely appreciative. So what yes. I said is that, so that appreciation was, it more than made up for the lack of appreciation from others. Yes. So yes, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, yes. And you mentioned Jai Dwayta Swami. You know, I, I was um, uh, privileged uh, to, to help him write his own book, uh, Vanity Karma. And in fact, he, uh, he came to me years ago and said, um, you know, Garuda, I, I, uh, I know how to write articles and edit and so on, but I've never written a book. So how do you write a book? So I helped him along the ways. Of course, he comes with enormous talent and, and capability already. But, you know, to write a book is an, an intimidating thing. And he wanted to write something comparative. And uh, anyway, it came out, you know, I think he writes really an extraordinary uh, piece uh, for which I agreed to even write the forward to it as a scholar. So, um, so again, it's, it's, you know, we all consult with one another. You know, we consult with one another. And that's, it's a kind of guild, you might say. Um, a loose guild. A loose guild. Um, um, it's nice to have, um, I ran some things in front of Jai Dwayta Swami years ago that I wanted to get his opinion on. Just a, 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 an interpretive piece. Um, uh, I didn't necessarily agree with everything he said in his critique, but I know him well enough to know how to make use of the critique. So that's the way we can all work together. Yeah. Yeah. So what you said earlier, writing is lonely. I think for writers to grow, there has to be some guild like this. They have to find it and they have to become a part of it. Then that uh, there is that internal nourishment, spiritual nourishment of connecting with the parampara. But we also need some social nourishment. Yes. And that probably will come through this. Sadhu Sangha is absolutely the most essential thing in any seva. Any seva. It's the very heart. And of course, as you know, Rupa Goswami boils everything down to five, you know, principles, five rules, mm. right? Yes. Bhagavata Seva, Harinam, right? Um, Matra, living in a place like Matra, right? Uh, or Vrindavan, um, uh, uh, deity worship or worshiping Tulsi, and then, but Sadhu Sangha, of the five, that has got to be the most important. Um, Ado Shraddha, what is next? Tata Sadhu Sangha. Mm -hmm. So you can have the faith, but it, it, it's no, it doesn't go anywhere unless the Sadhu Sangha is there. And I tr translate Sadhu Sangha in two ways. Typically, it's translated as a Tatpurusha Samasa in Sanskrit, which means the coming together, Sangha, coming together with saintly devotees. The That's one way. Sadhus. The Sangha of what? Sadhus. That one way, the Sangha of Sadhus. Tatpurusha the Sangha of Sadhus. That's right. Oh. And that's a and that's Tatpurusha Samasa. Yes. Okay? But I also translate it as a Karmadarya Samasa which says sadhu means is an adjective for sangha. So while in the first translation, sangha modifies sadhu, in the second form of a samasa or compound in Sanskrit, the first member modifies the second member. That's sadhu true. modifies sangha. Sadhu is perfect sangha. Perfect sangha. Perfect here means balanced reciprocal, the six exchanges. That's sadhu sangha. Most devotees don't understand it that way. They understand it first as a tatpurusha samasa. That's, and that's fine, but it also means perfect sangha, reciprocal sangha, balanced sangha. That's beautiful, Prabhu. You know, just to put it another way, I've realized that even if we associate with devotees, but if those devotees don't share our definitions of success, because each devotee in bhakti has their definitions of success, 
Yes. And sometimes that association, although it is a devotee association, can actually be discouraging or demoralizing. Yes, yes, it can. Sometimes, yes. in fact, you can go to the extreme. If you associate with some devotees, it's like being with them, we have to justify our very existence as a devotee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, too many times I've had to do that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I but think when you, know what? you were asked. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you were asked, just, you know, how can you write the Raslila book on the Raslila? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but that I expected, you know, I mean, Chaitanya Charan, that's reasonable because no one had done. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, um, it's a reasonable thing to be asked. And frankly, I don't mind being challenged about anything, Chaitanya Shra. Mm. I don't mind. I know some devotees can be a little sensitive, but I don't mind. I can be challenged on anything personal, professional, devotional, theological, anything. I'm an open book for anybody, but especially for someone like you with whom I enjoy sharing so much. Mm. It's amazing. So you love to be challenged. Oh, yes. On anything. I even tell my disciples that. I'm not, I know Prabhupada says that whatever the disciple hears from the guru, you must accept. I tell them, yes, you must accept to hear it enough. And if you want to challenge back, you can. And so I add a little phrase to it. If something, yes, you should accept it. But after accepting it and receiving it, you want to respond to it, react to it. You must do that. Let's not develop a culture of repression or suppression. Mm -hmm. Let's develop a culture of dialogue, genuine and truthful dialogue, dialogue that is transparent. Mm -hmm. That is sadhu. Sangha. Now you know what I mean by that. That's beautiful. You know, this, with this little dialogue, when you said, when you, after a class, you don't want praise, you want dialogue. I have, I've been writing for Back to Godhead. Yes. Now, Back to Godhead doesn't have a huge circulation, but I have found Nagaraj Prabhu and the panel of editors. Yes. They do a fairly good job. In fact, Nagaraj Prabhu does a very good job. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. I look forward more to the reviews of the articles by them rather than the publication of the article in the magazine. <laughs> because we learn over here some things. That's right. Very good. Well, that's the guild concept. The guild. Yeah. Yeah. So now I've also seen some devotees, they, they want to write, but they just can't accept critical reviews. They either oh. become defensive or they shut off or then they say that, you know, so many other people appreciate my writing. Why are you criticizing it? Or I'm writing only for self-expression. So then, of course, I keep a distance from them. But I, I'm sometimes not able to understand how that kind of writing works. So yeah. okay. Now, you know what? Sometimes writing um, in more of a kind of diary context, you know, and just self-reflection. Well, and that's, val that, that, that's a valid genre. I mean, what's wrong with that? No problem. And that, that kind of self-reflection, personal writing naturally would not warrant a critique or, um, you know, evolving a draft after a draft after a draft. Um, but if they intend it to speak to others, if they, attend, if they intend it to be a meaningful contribution to others, for more than just information, if it's just information that they want, well, then that's good enough. But, but if they want it to be something that is a meaningful publication, then it needs to have critique. Yeah, it needs peer review. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. So there are different forms of writing. When you write, Chaitanya Chan, you really want to speak to people. You want to, you want to contribute to people's understanding of Krishna Bhakti. So, you know, obviously you want the critique because you want it to be absorbable. 
Yeah. Like that vitamin pill we talked about earlier, right? They put other stuff with the vitamins so it's more absorbable. Well, sometimes our writing needs to have some stuff to make it more absorbable. That's okay. Yeah. You know, earlier when you had mentioned about writing either moving or intriguing or boring, yeah. I, I yeah. remember a metaphor I read about yeah. every author is taking uh, the readers on a trek. And yeah, yeah. The, if the it's a good trek leader, the trek leader arranges goodies to be found along the path of the trek. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you find that's the right. Thing, you feel keep, I want to move on. I want to move on. I want to move on. Of course, of course, it's sweet. It's nourishing, right? That's right. Yeah, you give them things along the way, but you give them the ultimate, the denouement, the conclusion, the climactic message. Yeah. Krishna's last words in the Gita to Arjuna, 18th chapter, 72nd verse. Have you heard this whole teaching with thought focused on the single highest point? What is that single highest point? That's what I went after when I did my translation and presentation. I found out. It's sort of a You are so much loved by me. That's it. That is the single highest point. We are not a tradition that chants and practices and has sadhana and so many different things because. We're just supposed to start doing that. All of that is a response to Krishna's love call, his flute, or his expression of love for us, his desire for us. Our bhakti is in response to Krishna's love and desire for us. Not all devotees really focus on this, but that's what we're about. Our bhakti is a... Our bhakti is a response. Bhakti is epiphenomenal. It's something that is a natural consequence of, be, of hearing Krishna's flute song, of, of, of hearing how, how Krishna desires us because he loves us. Ishto si me dhritam iti. Ishta, ishto, ishta. I desire you. I love you. Now, you know, I counted how many times in the Gita Krishna is preoccupied about souls coming to him. I counted over 20 times. Yes. If I say to you, Chaitanya Charan, I say, um, would you please call me sometime? And you say, yes, I'll call you. Chaitanya Charan, I really want you to call me sometime. <laughs> okay, Garuda, I will call you. Really, honestly, I'll call you. Hmm. Chaitanya Charan, I really, really, really want you to call me. I, now I'm saying it three times. Krishna doesn't say it just three times, four times, ten times, twelve times. He says it twenty times at least, probably twenty-three times. That's how much Krishna wants us to come to him. In 575 short verses, some of them are longer, you know, um, you know, they're not all anishtub, but, uh, you know, a longer meter to verses, that's fine. Trishtub and so on. But he manages to sneak that little message in throughout. It would be like throughout my talk with you today. You know, Chaitanya Charan, you should really call me sometime. We can talk more about this, you know. And I say it 23 times. First of all, you'll get a little sick and tired of, of hearing it. Well, but that's because I'm just an ordinary jiva. When Krishna, when divinity keeps telling us how much he has a passion for us to come to him, then we start chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. This is, this is our return response. The Ma Mantra is a return response. And as I conclude in the Dance of Divine Love book, 
It is the sonic replication of the Ras Mandala. Yeah, so I mean, and so are our beads circuitous. We dance around our beads this way, and then that way, and then this way, and then that way. And that's what the Vrajagopikas do with Krishna and the Ras Mandala. They dance clockwise and anticlockwise? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Well, well, we do that with the Japa. Okay. But yes, they go, they go back and forth. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. So... You know, I can see how much uh, devotional energy you have. You know, also being in academia, you have to read a lot of books which are not devotional books. Oh, yes. Oh, you can see them around. Yeah. <laughs> Although the Chaitanya Chartamita is right behind me. You can, you can okay. probably see that. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, do you keep a specific quantity of time when you always read devotional books? Because how do you avoid that? Uh, almost because of reading books which are constantly non-devotional, critical, not critical in a negative sense, but critical in a, just filled with uh, a critical technical. perspective. Technical. Yeah. So how do you maintain your devotion and devotional energy? I think it's really about how much, you know, you love what you're absorbed in. Um, and you go to these more technical treatises of which you mentioned uh, and to, for tools, okay. Like, like when you let's say uh, literally, um, in my garage, I have a toolbox. And when something needs to be built in the house, or something needs to be hung, a picture needs to be hung, get the tools out. Now, am I relishing the tools? You know, am I trying to buy fancy tools and get, getting distracted by the tools? No, they're tools. What I'm focused on is the picture that I'm hanging. So our picture of Krishna Bhakti theology, I'll use whatever tools I need to frame the picture, to hang the picture, to build the wall for the picture, and so on. But the picture is the main thing. That's the focus. So it's our love for our tradition, the love and the passion for uh, uh, going deeper and deeper and deeper into the tradition. And this is what moves me through all the technical treatises. I see everything as something that can either help me um, present Krishna Bhakti theology or something that doesn't. And over the years, I've gained many, many tools. And this, so this love for the message that you want to share, the picture of Krishna, that yes. love you nourish and protect by your devotional reading or because that also has to be, that's what we want to do, but how do we protect and nourish that? Well, we protect it, of course, by, um, uh, uh, by, well, you know, a frame, a frame protects a picture, right? It can contain a glass. It can, it, it holds the picture, but it also helps us focus on the picture. Can you imagine going to uh, the uh, uh, National Gallery of Art in downtown Washington and having a Rembrandt hanging there without a frame? I mean, that would be absurd. The frame, the more valuable the picture, the more elaborate the frame. Some of those frames are even hand carved. They're practically art in themselves. You and I, Chaitanya Charan, we are framers. We are carving beautiful, elaborate frames for our Krishna Bhakti theology. We're in the framing business. You're a framer. I'm a framer. We're carving all kinds of frames for the picture. I love this. So design. that's how... That's how we, we engage other tools, and that's how we keep focused on the picture. Yeah. So in a sense, when you read other books, it's more from a functional or a utilitarian perspective. It's, you know, 
you are basically getting tools from there and those tools could involve words they could be writing styles they could be even concepts which you can correlate with our traditional yes. concepts yes well i'm i'm a i'm a, a trained a theologian mm. my field is theology and psychology psychology and theology and and so i work with the nature of religious experience the nature of divinity and the world and the soul in relation to divinity and these are the kinds of things that I've received a lot of training for over the years at a place like Harvard University. So I'm bringing all of that knowledge and experience with me when I start writing. I, I'm not you know, conscious of all of it. I mean, it's too much, but I'm utilizing it. It's, it's, it's matured me. It's, it, you know, like, you know, some people like lift weights, right? You know, have you ever seen those people, right? They're lifting weights, right? Yeah. So, you know, all that training in the university was like lifting weights for the brain, for the intellect. Yeah. I had to learn how to strengthen my ability to be precise, to be accurate, to say a lot with a little, and sometimes to say a little about a lot. And, you know, I mean, all of these capacities are something that we go through in, in, the, in the educational process. Not that you need to have that, but when you do have it, those are tools, sometimes extra tools that are hard to get any other way. And of course, you are then opening, I mean, it doesn't hurt to go into a publisher with a Harvard degree. <laughs> it, it helps. It helps usually. It and helps a lot, yeah, yes. That's true. Yeah. I think you just made a very striking play of words. Can you repeat that? Sometimes say a lot with a little and then yes. use a little to say a lot or what are the other second that's things? Right. You said? That's right. That's right. You got it. That's right. That's right. Okay. You yeah. thought of it just now or you had, you had thought, thought no, of I'm it? Just, I'm just describing what I experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. One of the things you learn in graduate school is, is how to take an enormous amount of ideas and to describe them with very few words, but without dummying them down, without misrepresenting the thought, but how to be concise and how to, um, again, use words powerfully. Um, uh, uh, the more precise, the more accurate, the more true, the more sincere, the more honest, one uses words for the more powerful, the greater power words take on. So sometimes devotees will make, you know, statements like, sometimes I hear devotees sit down with guests at the uh, Sunday feast and they say, so look, um, you know, Prabhupada is a pure devotee and you should surrender to him because he's a pure devotee. He's connected to Krishna. He's, He's Krishna's representative. You see, the problem with those statements is that they move toward being platitudes. First of all, the question is, how do you know that Prabhupada is a pure devotee? That's the one question that's going to come up in a person's mind. Second of all, what is a pure devotee? You know, I mean, it's another question that's going to come up in one's mind. And why does it matter to me? And, and why does it even matter to me? Exactly. All these questions. Mm. But if some, if that same person sat down and said, I found in Srila Prabhupada someone who is the ambassador from the spiritual world, who has spoken so powerfully to me, and he's spread Krishna Bhakti around the world. So I've given my life to this. Would you like to know more? It's so beautiful, so relatable. It's honest, though. That's the point, Chaitanya Charan. You know, oh, okay. Prabhupada is a pure devotee. Well, you know what? I mean, you're skipping over. That's a non sequitur. How do you know Prabhupada? Who is Prabhupada? How do you know what is a pure devotee? You're, it, it becomes, you're skipping over too much. And second of all, you're, you're making a statement that is sort of sits out there as a kind of platitude, and it's in the third person, you, 
the person sitting next to you cannot refute what you directly experience, though. If I say Prabhupada is a pure devotee, that you know, that's one kind of statement. If I say, I love Prabhupada so much for what he has done, I want to reciprocate all the gifts I've gotten from him. That's why I'm here at this temple. Wow, what are these gifts? Wow, tell me more. You know, I, wow. You mean you were going to go in one direction in your life and then you found these gifts and then you redirected your whole life toward these gifts? Oh, I want to hear about that. It's genuine. It's powerful. Mm. And no one can tell you that that's not true. You yeah. start, you know, you know, Mahaprabhu Garanga, he says, even great stages disagree on points of philosophy. But it's the behavior of a Vaishnava that establishes the principles of religion. What is it? Uh, dharma, uh, uh, dharma, uh, dharma to Sak. No, no, no. Um, Shadura Bihara. Shadura Bihara. Um, uh, 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 anyway, it skips my mind, but anyway, it's, anyway, it's a direct statement from uh, Mahaprabhu in the Madhya Leela. But in any case, the point is this. If our words convey our actual realizations and behaviors, no one can refute them. They become powerful. They are truthful. We have to speak from that place. And then we become Brahmins. And we're speaking as Brahmins. And Brahmins use words as Shabda Brahman. Brahmans use word the Shabda Brahma. Beautiful. That's right. Yeah. With this point about speaking from our experience, I think this is one of the great untapped strengths of bhakti. Because yes. in the in the postmodern world, the ethos is the ultimate authority is experience. I don't care what mm. books you quote, I don't care whether you're scientific or not, all that. But yes. if something has worked for you, I want to know about it. And yes. We have not written, uh, in our tradition, we haven't written many books from that experiential genre. That's right. Adhant Mara Journey Home is probably the most successful. Yes. yes. Have you considered writing your autobiography, Prabhu? Oh my gosh. Um, my, I, I don't, first of all, think there's much of a market. Second of all, uh, but my wife has threatened me that she wants to write a biography. Um, <laughs> So, so he happens to think there are a lot of very funny and strange and weird things that brought me to Krishna Bhakti and things during my Krishna Bhakti experience that uh, devotees would, uh, uh, you know, enjoy hearing about and so on. So, I, you know, I might be willing to be interviewed on parts of my life and so on, but I will not, I will never write about my life. No, but I can write about my experience of within Krishna Bhakti. I can write about my experience, uh, the, the devotional experiences, the mystical experiences that I have. Um, but again, I prefer to give people mystical experiences rather than give them my own. That's for me. That's, that's simply a personal preference. When you say give people mystical experiences, means give people the resources by which they can have mystical experiences themselves. Yes, through my translations, through the message, the 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 Sarvagoyata Mubuya. That I want them to actually realize that Krishna is busy loving them. But mm -hmm. that's a secret. It's a secret because you're not ready to hear it. Although it's all over the Gita, but no one picks it up. Even the best scholars. In, in the academic world, who translate the Bhagavad Gita, they don't quite pick it up. I have my students read um, uh, together, you know, Prabhupada's Gita along with mine. And I tell them that this is, uh, this is someone who lived and breathed the Gita in this life. He, he embodied his whole life is embodied 
you know. And so this is what you get here. What you get here is proof that what Prabhupada says there is correct academically. But then I also show on the literary and theological level that these messages are powerful and that I don't have much room to write in here the way Prabhupada writes 900 pages of, of Bhashya. But many people have doubted. Sometimes people think that Prabhupada's Gita is too self-promotional. Be a devotee, join ISKCON, etc., etc. Right? But I say you have to you have to look at the message of what Prabhupada is saying. He's saying we are meant to perform. We are meant to live a life of devotion. And only then will we be happy. You know, I never somehow I'm surprised I, I never thought of this point that actually your Gita is uh, substantiating Prabhupada's uh, message in the Gita. Yes. The, the, the strategy you are using is very different, mm -hmm. but, but you are arriving at the, you are showing how what Prabhupada says is the conclusion of the Gita and what Prabhupada right. says throughout the Gita, you are actually showing how that is the essential message of the Gita. That's right. My Gita supports what Prabhupada's Gita was, um, is saying. And, um, and they get this, the students get the practitioner and the scholar together. That's beautiful. And this you do in yeah. a, this you do for your disciples or this you do in your academic classes? Both. Yeah, both. I, I, uh, I, I uh, this fall I'm teaching 120 students. They're all going to purchase Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, and they're going to purchase mine, and they're going to read them together. They get a very full experience that way. Very full. I found that Prabhupada's Gita is very much a devotee's Gita. And unless you're a devotee, you know, somehow dormant, you know, the, I've seen some students come out and say, oh my gosh, Dr. Schweig, I've been waiting for this book all my life. But very few people come out of the class saying that. So what I found is I needed them to appreciate the Gita more by uh, the help of a bridge over into Prabhupada's Gita. So my Gita can function as a bridge as well as being intrinsically valuable with a message. So it, it can function both ways. So I, I, I use them both. Now you're a brahmachari. I mean, I'm a householder. I have a job. You know what my job is? That's unbelievable. I go into the university and what do I teach? Krishna Bhakti. And they pay me. Can you believe that? It's I'm spoiled. I'm just utterly spoiled. Mm -hmm. Philosophy of yoga, you know, Bhagavad Gita course, comparative religions, which is what my degree is in. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said there is bhakti in all true religion. So I'm busy showing my students how there is bhakti in all true religions. First, they have to understand bhakti from Bhagavad Gita. Then they can see in all true religions, there is bhakti. That, and I get a paycheck for that. This is actually like a dream for a devotee to, be able <laughs> yeah. to get forums, which as an as ISKCON devotee, you would never be able to reach. That's right. In fact, one of the things now I have in the last five years, I've been spending almost nine months a year in the Western world. Six months in America and three months in UK, Australia, New Zealand, other places. So mm. Radhanath Maharaj, Radha Maharaj asked me to uh, spend more time in helping uh, or in serving in Western outreach, whatever we can do. So what I noticed is that even in our temples, or temples we hardly get any Western people, but even in our uh, customized for Western outreach centers, we, we are not really attracting uh, the intellectual elite, whether it is in the college programs or whether it is in the other programs. So I think we come off as a little sectarian or otherworldly. Yes. If we want to reach the intellectual elite, actually we have to go through their forums. Yeah. Kind of right. people you will reach 
uh, it's very difficult for them to ever themselves to come to a temple and attend a program. That's right. That's right. We have to be sensitive to our audience. We have to know our audience. I, I heard some advanced devotees uh, coming together in a meeting. I was on the Zoom meeting with them. And they were talking about how we have to give Krishna, you know, to others out in the world. It's needed more than we have to give Krishna. I said, that's well and fine. But you can't give something to someone unless you know that someone well enough. You, you have to be sensitive to where they're coming from. Otherwise, they're not receptive. You know, I spend much of my time making my audience, putting them at ease, making them comfortable. Um, and the more receptivity I feel from them, the more I deliver. It's a careful balance. The greater the receptivity, the more we can deliver. The, the less the receptivity, the less we can deliver. It's part of just being an experienced teacher, you know. Very important, though. Very important. Otherwise, you're giving them too much. You're overloading them. And they will feel that you're not sensitive to them. They will feel, they'll interpret that as you don't really care about them. And then they go away. That's true. I think, you know, I think Samuel Butler, he said that what is written without effort is read without pleasure. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. So, Prabhu, one question. You said that uh, you were able to get to a press which presents scholars who don't write in a very scholarly or academic way. So did you do any conscious changes? Because you know, that is the genre, you could say popular philosophy. Hmm? Like Richard yes. Dawkins got into popular science. So popular philosophy, that is the genre which I am also targeting. I have also written one book on the Ramayana, which, uh, which is not a retelling of the Ramayana, but it is, it is applicational essays based on the Ramayana. So I take incidents and draw human lessons from them. And that's, Very nice. and that's done quite, I call it wisdom from the Ramayana. It, uh, in about two and a half years, it has sold about 20,000 copies. So, Beautiful. Wonderful. I'm going to have to get some copies of your books. It's wonderful. Yes, Lord. So, so no, thank you for your kind words. I just wanted to know, did you do any reading? To, see, I, I was, I've never been an academic scholar in that sense, but I read extensively and I think deeply, I try to think deeply. So, what does it take to say make philosophy popular or rather to reach read reach philosophy to a popular audience a broader audience are there any books you would recommend or what would you recommend if somebody wants to write in this genre hmm. books to recommend i i couldn't say but because again my training comes from you know many years of university uh, yeah. work and education, but, but if, again, we have to return to that passion. If we really have a message that we want to give to others, and now we can add the other factor, which we just talked about, mm. and if that audience, if we really know that audience, then we can deliver. You know, um, even the heaviest kind of philosophy, and you know, our Krishna Bhakti theology is actually very, very complex and deep and rich. Mm. And sometimes I think devotees simplify it, and uh, and and even to the point of sim being simplistic. Yeah. And we have to be careful. Now, not every devotee is going to be as trained as as uh, others of us and in, in experienced, and that's okay. But uh, but then, you know, if an audience requires very sophisticated presentation, then we need to bring the right people in. We need to bring the right people in. Okay. So, 
This is something we have to be sensitive to. We have to be sensitive to our audience. Mm. So I do know when I wrote uh, The Dance of Divine Love, I know that the, uh, the executive editor there said, write this so a, an intelligent layperson can read it. So I worked an extra year and a half to make that possible. Really? Extraordinary. Yes. So year and a half, yes. you worked on your PhD thesis to modify it? Or? Oh, 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 this book took a long time. First of all, there's four years at Harvard. And that's my uh, 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 dissertation. Then after Harvard, I worked for several years, more. So the dissertation was 550 pages. Then after that, it went to 2,800 pages, manu manuscript pages, okay, double-spaced, okay? 2,800 pages, because I was drawing from and translating the commentaries of the uh, Bhagavata. Remember, the, the, there weren't these sort of... Um, moderately okay translations being produced like there are today. Back in, in the late 90s or early 90s, there were no translations of Vishwanathas works or anything. I had to translate it myself. I had to go in and translate, which was better anyway. I'd have to do that in any case because a lot of these um, translations uh, are done by devotees who are familiar with Sanskrit, they're not necessarily terribly careful translations, especially when devotees keep sort of churning out translations. They're not terribly careful translations. And in Sanskrit, you want to, you want to, you know, unearth, you want to, um, you, you want to excavate the richness of the Sanskrit terms. So just quick translations don't do that. So when I translate, I go for the richness and I do it slowly and I do it carefully. And that's the result, you know, of Dance of Divine Love to 2,800 pages. Now, when I got to Princeton and they want to, wanted to publish it, they said, we're not going to publish 2,800 pages. We'll publish 800 pages. So I had to get rid of 2,000 pages. Ah, oh, oh, painful, 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 right? But... I was able to consolidate and essentialize and distill most of it, but it was very hard. It took me a year and a half more. So overall, the book ten, it took 10 years to come out. These things are never easy to produce. These very deep scholarly, but also accessible, layperson accessible, Treatises. Some people have written to me how this book, they said, is some of the most beautiful book in the world they've ever read. These are people I don't even know. These are not even devotees. Well, they must be devotees. I mean, so, and I've had, and, and then one devotee, a god brother of mine, read the book recently and said, this should be required reading for every GBC person. Anyway, I, I don't know. I get different reactions. And they're wonderful, and uh, they're often effusive, and not just praise, but appreciations. And it's very gratifying, and you know what that's like. You get plenty of that, too. So it's nice. It's nice to get that, of course. But we can't possibly comprehend all of it, and how people so much appreciate what it is that we've offered. So this is Krishna Kripa. Amazing. So, well, I have, I have kept you on here for quite some time, Chaitanya Charan. I don't know that you want to use all of this, but um, it's up to you what you use. Yes, bro, this is personally exciting for me. And oh, good. Good. Very much. Me too. And uh, I, I, have a, like, I have a few devotees who regularly hear this podcast. I'm planning that I will share it with them first. Yes. And then I'm sure there are devotees who like to write and they would love this. And yes. Other devotees may not find it that relevant, but that way, actually, for devotees who want to write, we don't have much encouraging material. 
Yes. We have some instructions of Shri Prabhupad that devotees should write, but institutionally, the pressure for devotees to do other services that the institution requires. That is, That's right. Collect funds and do other menial services in the temple. That is so much. And they also get some appreciation for those services. That's right. For writing, they don't get those appre that appreciation. So I think for those devotees, this would be a very, very nourishing. Good. Wonderful. Well, I am delighted to serve you and your uh, series here and to serve any devotees that would benefit from it. I'm, it is a privilege and an honor, Chaitanya Charan. Oh, this is far, Thank you. Far, far, far better than, far, far richer and enriching than what I had expected. And I would humbly and uh, fervently request you to join for more podcasts in future. And we didn't... However, we could, we didn't even touch on the theme we were going to touch on, I think. That's, true. <laughs> That's really funny. I guess when you get two writers together, they can't help themselves. Huh? <laughs> That's very true. So Yeah, it's good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again, very much. it was an honor. And let's, and let's um, yes, let's plan again. I'm happy to, to be here with you and explore other topics. Yes, I look forward to that, Prabhu. Just let me know when you are free. I'm, I'll adjust my schedule accordingly. Excellent. I will do. Thank you very much, Gurudamru. Humble obeisances. My pranams, my affection and pranams. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.